Anyway, thank you very much, um, especially to you, Michael, for giving, giving us this, this overview. Um, as Michael explained, uh, th this is a, a new venture for many of us. It certainly is for me. Uh, I'm quite used to the opposite process towards drug discovery, and that is that you do some basic research in a lab, you see some promise in a, a respected animal model, and then you try to find ways to move this into human clinical practice. What we're dealing with here is the inverse of that. A group of people who are extremely well trained um, have a different perspective on the development med of medicine uh, as compared to uh, our approach. And yet I think that, they, that, that we're going to see that this approach to discovery is as valid as the, the one that, that we use normally. Um, I think an important point to mention here is the fact that uh, this is a collaboration not with a herbal medicine uh, expert, but somebody who is truly one of the gifted phytochemists in the world. Uh, Vietnam is, is um, fortunate to have and to have developed a National Academy of Sciences. And the premier institute amongst their many National Academy of Science institutes is the Institute for Medicinal Chemistry. And Dr. Sung is the, is the head of that institute. And so when he heard about uh, this development by uh, the herbal specialist, Dr. Dan, um, his first step was to start to investigate the ingredients. Uh, and then uh, it, originally this was actually a, a liquid form that was uh, consumed orally. And so in collaboration with his colleagues in Germany, uh, they identified um, the most um, promising of, of the various candidate drugs that Dr. Dan had, um, had identified personally, uh, and then began a process of purification, uh, a standardized uh, extraction and mixing, uh, uh, the introduction of good laboratory practices, good manufacturing practices, so that they came up with something which is a powdered material pictured here that can be given um, with confidence to, to humans because it's non-toxic. They did the, the appropriate toxicology. Uh, there is a history uh, of off-label use of this compound in Vietnam. It's not doing any harm. It's now standardized and it can be used in, in, in clinical trials. So when Michael and I went there two years ago uh, and saw firsthand um, the promise that this particular um, therapy might have, I offered to Dr. Sung to conduct um, some preclinical experiments um, that might provide further insights into maybe mechanism of action, can we show that it's working in the brain, you know, a host of pretty obvious questions from our perspective. And that's what I want to share with you um, right now. Um, sorry, wrong computer. Um, <clears throat> so Michael's already outlined the, the important ingredients in the research agenda. Um, this. Uh, picture to the right, it was taken from an article that was published in Nature in 2005. I think it was a fairly balanced approach uh, to the fact that uh, um, these, in, these colleagues in Vietnam were, were trying a different approach to the, the, the treatment of uh, opiate withdrawal, um, and uh, it certainly seemed to merit further investigation. I think the important thing to emphasize is the fact that this clinical trial is nearing completion the design of the current trial does have, even though it's still uh, tested against um, a neuroleptic, it's a much better design. So I think that the data will um, provide some evidence, uh, hopefully, of efficacy. Um, but the real unknown here is that to date, practically, well, nothing is known about the action of this, of this um, compound on the brain. There has been no preclinical behavioral assessment using standardized psychopharmacological procedures. And so what I want to do in the next few minutes is share with you the experiments we've done over the last two years in our lab at UBC, principally in collaboration with my colleague, Dr. Karine Diaz, who's been responsible for the uh, behavioral pharmacology, and my colleague, Dr. Soyeon On, who's been responsible for the brain neurochemistry. And so the first experiments I'm going to describe employ a procedure that's used uh, in preclinical studies to try to assess whether or not a compound um, has abuse liability because, it, because an animal uh, finds it to be rewarding. 
And a very simple way of assessing this is to use this uh, apparatus here called a, a condition place preference box. And it's a very simple apparatus in which a box is divided into two quite distinctive compartments. And an animal can visit either compartment by moving through this, um, this doorway. And what happens in the experiment is that you randomly assign the animal to one of these two compartments. And on four days, you give it the a drug that you suspect may have, or you're interested in assessing whether it has abuse liability. And then on the other day, the animal gets the vehicle in the opposite compartment. And these compartments are randomized. Um, the lighting is uh, adjusted so that the animals have an equal preference between the two compartments. Then after eight days of, uh, of conditioning, uh, in a non-drug state, you place the animal at this choice point, and then you simply measure the amount of time that the animal chooses to spend in each of these compartments. We began using this procedure in the 1970s, and it's become quite a popular procedure for assessing uh, drug reward. And so if you were to give morphine in this compartment, the animal would spend significantly more time in the compartment in which it had received morphine, cocaine, heroin, tranquilizers, every drug that a human chooses to uh, self-administer will yield a preference in this apparatus. So we were interested in uh, <coughs> assessing the effects of Hiantos initially on the, reward, the known rewarding effects of morphine. And so all, the next few slides will show the data in a standardized way. What we're measuring is the amount of time in this non-drug state that the animal chooses to spend in the compartment that was associated with morphine uh, as, a, um, as compared to the compartment in which it received the saline vehicle. And every time you see uh, a significant increase in the opiate compartment, morphine compartment relative to saline, that means that we have a significant place preference. What we did in this experiment is give the animal Hiantos um, in these various doses, 100, uh, 100 milligrams, 250, and 500 milligrams, 30 minutes before we gave the, the injection of morphine. So we're looking at what happens on the induction, the formation of the association between the rewarding effects of the drug and the distinctive environment. Will Hiantos affect that? Well, it clearly did. At these higher doses, it blocks the ability of morphine to form a condition place preference. Interestingly, this is an experiment in which the animal received morphine uh, with just a vehicle, and then on the test for learning, the expression of the morphine place preference, we asked the question of whether Hiantos could block an already established place preference, and clearly it cannot, because you always see the morphine compartment favored over the saline compartment. So this is encouraging. This compound is blocking the rewarding effects of morphine in a place preference. We, we were also quite concerned uh, that, uh, and again, I should add that we haven't been privy to all of the active ingredients in Hiantos because this is a proprietary drug in Vietnam. It's patented in Vietnam. Uh, the Vietnamese colleagues are quite understandably concerned about the proprietary rights. Our uh, role in all of this is to help and to facilitate hopefully the development of this. Um, so we respect the fact that they haven't disclosed all the active ingredients to date. But one thing that we were quite frankly worried about is whether or not there might be some rewarding property of Hiantos itself and that it might have abuse liability. So we did an experiment, Karine did an experiment in which she, uh, here we were not sure what we were gonna get. Were we going to see place preference or as it turned out, place aversion. And so there's a, if you put Hiantos in one, uh, uh, give Hiantos prior to placing the animal in one distinctive compartment, what happens is that you actually develop a slight aversion to that compartment. So this drug has no abuse liability, at least in terms of this particular measure, which is also encouraging. And then uh, the other experiment that we could do is look at something called um, a naloxone precipitated aversion. So in, in the human situation in Vietnam, you have individuals who are voluntarily choosing to withdraw from treatment with heroin. So they're in withdrawal. Then the question is, can we 